Hi, this is Tim of the 1916 Company. Today, we have a showdown between sports chronographs from big three luxury brands. We've got two of the big three here with Omega and Breitling versus Starts Now. We're going to start with a watch that's probably more familiar in recent years. The Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Dark Side of the Moon bears the Moonwatch name, but it's very much a modern watch. It's not attempting to recall any specific retro style, nor is it part of the core catalog of Speedmaster Professionals that still flies with NASA. This watch is very much terrestrial in its intent. Launched in 2013, its standout feature is its full sapphire and ceramic construction. So the case here, 44.25 millimeters in diameter, 16.7 millimeters thick, and from lug tip to lug tip, 49.7 millimeters with a 21 millimeter spacing in between the lugs. Now, when I throw this watch on my wrist, it is a big watch. It's thick and it's large in diameter, but it's so short across the wrist, again, my wrist is 16 centimeters, that you find it really doesn't overwhelm. It doesn't look like it's gonna poke out over the edge and embarrass me with some ill-considered proportion. It is thick and it will not fit underneath the cuff, but that's true of both of today's watches. You can take a good look at the watch. Down the barrel, the lugs are not over the edge of my wrist and you can see that quite well. It's extremely comfortable, sits well, and doesn't feel like it would move around a lot. While the watch was available on a deployment clasp, the example you see right here is on a matching ceramic pin and buckle, and I really appreciate that for the ease of adjustment. And one thing I like about Omega is that as part of the Swatch Group, they have the material science might in-house, that this can be made of zirconium oxide. So this is a full pin and buckle and ceramic. And this is the part underneath your wrist that's gonna go desk diving all day long as you move your hands around your desk and across your keyboard. This is where a lot of companies will give you some sort of DLC titanium or steel piece that gets scratched. Not so here, Omega going all out to match buckle to case to bezel to dial and yes you could see zirconium oxide the dial is also made of black ceramic giving it that lustrous longevity that you expect from enamel without the fragility or the expense now we'll do a quick loom shot here so you get a sense of this watch in fact we may bring them both into the frame uh, spoiler alert the omega has better loom but we'll talk about that in just a moment also take note that the omega has a luminescent chrono seconds hand that you will not find on the breitling but in terms of luminescence, both of them are readable in the dark. Not necessarily chronograph functions, but you can see the time. One element where I feel like the Omega is a little bit better is that the dial looks more expensive. And we'll talk about advantages in just a moment, but as we roll over, you can see that the crystal here was calculated to look a little bit like the Hesalite or the thermoplastic that you find on a Speedmaster Professional. And then we've got crown and pusher all in matching black ceramic. On the back, we've got caliber 9300. This is a movement that is automatic winding with bi-directional action, 60 hour power reserve, two barrels in series for a nice flat torque curve. Again, 60 hour power reserve, but the twin barrels are really there, not so much for long power reserve, but to keep that torque curve flat. Also pursuant to regular timekeeping, we have COSC chronometer certification and the coaxial escapement of George Daniels, a very cool piece of independent horology tech that's found its way into a mainstream watch in this Omega. Vertical clutch, column wheel, anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and a very well-braced free sprung balance with a full balance bridge for toughness, and that's important. You can see the column wheel underneath a skeletonized bridge that makes for crisp actuation, and then you can see the vertical clutch allows for operation of the chronograph without any skip or jump to the chrono seconds hand. You can also leave it running on a full-time basis if you like. That's one of the advantages of a vertical clutch, but both these watches have them. Now, let's talk about the advantages of the Omega here. Scratch resistant, the whole watch, sapphire case back, sapphire crystal over the dial, crowns, pushers, buckle, bezel, case, Everything here is highly scratch resistant ceramic. I've never seen a permanent mark on a dark side of the moon, and I've been doing this since 2014, so these hold up really well. Also, shock resistance. Taking a look at the movement, uh, you can see real easily that this is a much more sophisticated arrangement than what Breitling has. Breitling has a nice micrometric regulation system for fine tuning, but you can also see how this is a single sided balance cock, and in theory, a little bit of concussion or jolting could move the index, whereas here you have a dual anchored balance bridge and a free sprung balance. All the adjustments are done with variable inertia bolts on the rim of the balance itself. This is a more robust system against shock. Altogether, lots to love here. 
This watch also has that cool George Daniels coaxial escapement tech. Now, I'm not necessarily saying it's a better timekeeper than the Breitling on that front, just that the technology is more imaginative. It's a double impulse, direct and indirect impulse system, but its real hallmark is that it uses tangential friction rather than the sliding friction of a conventional Swiss lever. So this is probably still the most exotic escapement you can find in a sub $50,000 watch, and that makes it very impressive from my perspective. Taking a quick look, you can see that we do have this time zone feature. So the chrono keeps running, running seconds keeps operating, and you can see that we're not displacing the minute hand in any way or the chrono minutes and hours. So this is a setup that allows me to travel quite easily. Now I do have hacking seconds where I can pull the crown out all the way and stop everything. So if I do wish to synchronize to a reference time, that's readily available. Also a cleaner dial. You can see how we have a twin register style dial like a vintage chrono, but we have superimposed coaxial chrono hours and minutes over at three o'clock to keep that dial clean, but give you the functionality of a modern tri-register chrono. Better loom you saw just a moment ago. Not only is it brighter, but we also have a loomed chrono seconds hand, which can come in handy in the dark. And even though it's a small distinction, this watch is 50 meters water resistant and this watch is 30 meters water resistant. So hey, more is better, even if neither one of these watches should be taken swimming. And I would also argue that Omega is the stronger brand right now. If you want something that hails from a stouter brand name, either for status purposes or for resale purposes, it's going to be the Omega. Now the Omega retails for $12,000 and it sells pre-owned out of warranty for about $8,000 to $8,500. And I do think the strength of the Omega brand is one of the reasons for the comparative resale and price premium when new. I just think that Omega sits above Breitling and below Rolex in the current hierarchy of the Swiss luxury big three. That's where Omega is. I also think the strap is probably better than the one you get on the Breitling. It has the same calfskin on the bottom, but look at this luxurious contrasting stitch. Look at the textile on top to give it durability against abrasion. Look at how they sewed in a gusset to prevent the pin buckle from gouging the strap. Over here, you don't get any of that. You get a steel buckle, you get calfskin with a contrasting stitch. It's calf on the top, calf on the bottom, no gusseting right there. So while this is a nice soft and plush strap, it doesn't bode well for longevity that Omega's is constructed this much better and Breitling is still giving you a 1950s style pilot strap. But let's take a look at what the Breitling has to offer. So this is the Breitling Navitimer B01 Chronograph 43. And I think it's important to note that neither one of these is really a core model. Uh, technically, if you wanted a core model Navitimer, you'd want something like the Reference 806 1959 reedition, which was a limited series and not available on a continuous basis. So these automatic display case back Navitimers, they're really not the core watch. They're a version of the Navitimer. And you could say the same thing about the dark side of the moon. This is not the Speedmaster Professional. This is the Speedmaster Moonwatch dark side of the moon. So it is a variation on the theme. That's really what both of these are. Someday we'll do like a 806 1959 versus a Moonwatch, and that'll be a light for like comparison. But since each one of these departs a bit from the core genus, it is a unique breed. 43 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel. We have a thinner profile, 14.3 millimeters, and from lug tip to lug tip, very similar to the Moonwatch, 49.2, the Moonwatch is 49.7, and this one has a 22 millimeter spacing between the lugs. Retail on this, 9,250. Pre-owned, it's gonna be about 5,800 to 6,200. In my opinion, reflecting the fact that Breitling doesn't have quite the brand equity that Omega has. Otherwise, this would cost the same amount new as the Omega and probably retain the same value used. What I will say here is that the watch feels like it's a better fit. Now that's an odd thing to say since the watch in steel is heavier, but in terms of thickness, there's a pretty big advantage here. This is 14.3 compared to 16.7 on the Omega. Another real advantage here is that the strap is softer. So at least when new, the strap is gonna be more supple on the wrist and better bend around the curve of the wrist. And at least to my eye, this watch being flatter and flusher with proportionally tinier lugs than previous Navitimers, this seems to fit better. 
Okay, what else does it have going for it? Well, this unique calculator system. So this was not the first circular slide rule logarithmic scale calculator chronograph from Breitling. That was the Chronomat of about 1942. And I think there was a Mimo Loga that actually beat Breitling's two chronograph calculators to market in the early 40s with a logarithmic scale calculator. But the Navtimer is best known for this. Now it's an easy system to use. Let's say you want to divide eight by four. Really simple. You set it up like a fraction. I put eight on the top scale over four on the bottom scale. Then I go to the red index, which is this little 10. So eight divided by four is two. Very simple. Let's say I want to multiply 15 by three. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put 15 over that scale and find three on the inner scale and look above it. And 15 times 3 is 45. you got to keep decimals in mind, but it will be a very quick and handy thing to calculate the tip at a restaurant. You can impress your friends. Now, this is very cool, and it has a lot of real history behind it. I feel like this is closer to a core Navitimer than that is to a core Moonwatch. So I feel at least the look here is classically 1950s Navitimer, even if obviously things like the colors, the dial, and the beating of the bezel, they're different. But this is a very classical 1950s aviator's chrome chronograph aesthetic. I would also say less money new or used. This is a watch that is going to take less out of your pocket, which leaves more money for a better strap if you do want to go one for one against the Omega. I would also say that this is a better looking movement. You can see how much of the chronograph is visible on the B01 caliber. And overall, I feel particularly because of the amount of the chrono that's visible, it's just a better looking movement that the finish, though mechanical on both, is more attractive on the Breitling. And you are free to disagree. You might find that the spiral arabesque stripes on the Omega with the blackened screws are more intriguing. But consider how little of the chronograph mechanism you could see. You've got that skeletonization for the column wheel, but you don't have a whole lot of visibility of other elements, including levers, horns, recentering hammers. I like the way this looks, and that that's my position and I'm sticking to it. Thinner. There's no disputing the fact that this is quite a bit thinner. 14.3 versus 16.7. This watch looks and feels thinner on the wrist. I'll also say this. I've long sung the praises of the column wheel feel on Breitling's B01 chronograph. And it is far superior to the column wheel feel on this caliber 9300. Also important, this watch has 70 hours of power reserve. This watch has 60. And while it's not a huge distinction, it might be the difference between your watch still ticking on Monday morning and having to reset it if you haven't worn it over the weekend. So I think on that front, advantage Navitimer. So which one would I prefer? Uh, call me crazy, but somehow I find myself gravitating towards the Navitimer. Something about the uniqueness of the slide rule and chronograph tandem, and the fact that it does feel lighter and better sized and better proportioned on the wrist. I'm also drawn to the superior power reserve, column wheel feel, and aesthetics of the movement. Even though neither one of these is a hand-finished watch, this just looks a little bit more impressive and special from the back. And in terms of being really a core model, this is several degrees removed from the Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch, whereas in the absence of a regular production manual wind Navitimer, this sort of does become the core model, which gives it a lot of status, I think, and stature inside of the Breitling family. I should have mentioned, yes, you have stop seconds here, and yes, you have a quick set date, just in case there's any doubt about that. So I think tech-wise, this has the edge, and scratch resistance-wise, this has the edge, and brand equity-wise, this has the edge. This is the watch I would rather own, and it's all down to history, heritage, fit, and ambiance. And yep, I'm a sucker for the intangible factors. You guys, got, you guys let me know in the description below, which one of these do you prefer? Cost an object, cost no object, and would you like to see a regular production Emanuel Wind Navitimer in the catalog? Let me know.